Welcome back to the channel. I recently saw online that somebody had posted clips of Francis Collins, who was the NIH director during the COVID-19 pandemic. He was in charge of the NIH budget. And in this video, there's a series of clips where he talks about errors he made, points of view he had about other people like the Great Barrington Declaration, and he sort of revisits the pandemic. I want to show those clips and comment about them because I think they're an extremely illuminating portrait into the failed legacy of Francis Collins and why the people in charge of the COVID-19 pandemic response did a terrible job. Even in retrospect, he doesn't properly admit his errors. So I want to talk about what he says happened and what actually happened. So let's go through the clips. This should be an interesting video. So let's start. Clip number one. All right, I've excerpted these from a longer video. This video actually came out about five months ago, but it went unnoticed because nobody likes watching boring videos of former NIH directors. Okay, even I didn't watch it. I've got better things to do. But once I saw the clips, I went back and watched the whole thing. So let me play you some of the clips that I think are interesting. The first one is on masking. So the idea that people should walk around wearing masks early on didn't seem to be necessary. If you're feeling fine, you're probably not infectious. Wrong, but we didn't know it was wrong. There was also an argument about, well, masks are in shortage and we should save them uh, for the people in the hospitals. And that was sort of an argument too. And then we found out we were completely wrong about that. And the opportunity here to turn this into a lesson about science, where you think you have the data, but then the data changes and then you realize, oh, I have to change my conclusion. We totally blew it on that. So that's what he says. What are my problems with this? Well. Even in retrospect, he's being incredibly dishonest, all right? Let's go back through the facts. We have had a series of at least 14 randomized control trials of the use of respiratory masks in a variety of settings prior to the pandemic. That totality of evidence was, bluntly speaking, totally negative. That was, in fact, the opinion of Cochrane's review of that evidence, which actually sought to be published in first quarter of 2020, but faced many delays and only came out later in 2020. But anybody who looked at the randomized evidence would come to that conclusion. Myself, Jonathan Darrow, and Ian Liu, we performed our own meta-analysis of the randomized evidence in 2020, and we eventually published that in the Cato Institute, and then we published that in a peer-reviewed journal. And we have a 60-page review on masking efficacy. So I think anybody who is a real scientist who looked at the evidence of masking in early 2020 would have come to the conclusion that it doesn't work. And that's why the CDC, and that's why Fauci went on 60 Minutes and said it didn't work. Then later, within the next eight weeks, they did a 180 degree reversal. Francis Collins makes it seem like the science changed. The science didn't change. They didn't generate any credible evidence in those eight weeks. There was no new evidence that was generated of any relevance that was better than the pre-existing body of evidence, which is totally negative. We'll talk about how he could have done something. He changed his opinion because he was under pressure from an activist campaign of people who don't know anything about clinical medicine or public health. They're mostly mechanistic scientists who pressured him to implement a masking policy. They went with cloth masks, which we now know did absolutely nothing of value. They just simply don't work. They didn't work in the cluster randomized trial in Bangladesh. And that was their recommendation for years, for literally a year. What am I to think when he says it was an opportunity to educate the public when he needs to educate himself? He's still being dishonest in this video. The evidence was negative. It is currently negative. We've had multiple randomized control trials. The totality is still negative. Community masking doesn't work. and. He was wrong then. He did it because of pressure. He did it because it was a political badge, but he certainly didn't do it because of science. And then the last thing I'd say to him, he's the director of the NIH. He controls the entire NIH budget. He could have answered the question like a real scientist by running a cluster randomized control trial on the question. He could have randomized municipalities or neighborhoods or districts or dorm rooms or floors in a dorm or hospital wards to a masking policy, no masking policy and followed outcomes later. He could have run what they did on a shoestring budget in Bangladesh in the United States. That's what a real scientist would have done. A real scientist would understand there's uncertainty and would test that prospectively. He didn't do that. He's derelict of his duties. He's still dishonest in retrospect. He has no excuse. I'm not the NIH director. I can't snap my fingers and make a randomized trial happen. He can compel it to happen. Now, some people say, oh, well, it's difficult to do. It's very challenging. We are working on making driverless cars. People are studying ways to implant a chip in the brain so you can control the digital screen through your brain activity. We are capable of great engineering feats. We can certainly do a cluster randomized trial in the United States. In fact, we did a cluster randomized trial in the Guinea-Bissau and in Bangladesh. Two random people did those things. 
but not the auspices of the US government. The only reason why they didn't do the proper study must be that they don't want to know the answer to the question. So here Francis Collins, even in retrospect, is dishonest. And the reason is his audience, of course, which tends to be left of center, they want to hear the message that masking works. And so even in retrospect, completely dishonest. Let's play the next clip. It just keeps getting worse for him, by the way. It's just going to keep getting worse for this guy. Uh, China didn't have a problem with politicians disagreeing with the leadership, <laughs> and nor, nor did they have a media problem, but we sure had every possible voice, many of them with all kinds of intentions that were not noble, uh, ready to capitalize on a circumstance where there was uncertainty and resentment and anger and fear and whip that up in the biggest way. And wow. So... China, of course, doesn't have a problem with dissenting opinions. Yeah, it's a totalitarian regime. We live in a free country, Francis. So what sort of an expert, what sort of a leader doesn't understand that there's going to be a plurality of voices? I once heard Jay Bhattacharya say this quite eloquently, where somebody said, lockdowns would have worked had it not been for people like you and Martin Kohlsdorf and the Great Barrington Declaration, had it not been for people like you who are scientists who are openly skeptical of lockdowns. And Jay said in response, which I think is the best response, what does it say about your public health intervention that it is so fragile that even one scientist who disagrees with it is enough to thwart its effect nationally? It tells you it wasn't a great public health intervention to begin with. My point here is that Francis Collins must understand we live in a free country. What Anytime you implement anything that has never been done in human history, there's going to be somebody who's actually smart and well-intentioned who disagrees with you. And if your policy is so flimsy and your worldview so narrow that you don't know what to do with these dissenting voices, then you shouldn't be implementing that policy in the beginning, okay? Policies have to be robust enough to face challenges, to face people being skeptical of them and still succeed in that in a free society. So he's lamenting that we can't shut down speech like China, can't shut down dissenting voices. Of course, politicians on the other side of the spectrum are going to disagree with you. Of course, some scientists are going to disagree with you. You locked down society. You closed schools for year after year. Those were bad ideas in the beginning, not just in retrospect. Absolutely, somebody's going to disagree with you about these policies. You need to have a forum to debate those people, to have those dialogues. You're the NIH director. You could have had a series of town halls where you invited people like Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Kohlsdorf and had an open discussion of the pros and cons. You could put them on YouTube. You have the powers of the federal government. You held zero debates. You just went on TV and you said proclamation after proclamation. You never tried to assess those. You never conducted randomized trials of NPIs. You never tried to minimize uncertainty. You never brought anyone to the table who might disagree with you. If you were a general in war, you would be the dumbest general on the planet. Because even a general in war wants someone at the table who says, hey, you think maybe we shouldn't invade? Someone make the case that this was a bad idea. Let's hear that argument. I want to hear that argument so I can counter that argument or consider that argument, temper my response. Anybody who makes any significant decision wants to have somebody at the table who disagrees with them. Even in my own tiny research team, recently working on a project where the student in charge of the project says, you know, I agree with you that this drug has no evidence, but I agree with you, but I think this clinical entity is better described than you define it. I say, it's great. It's great that you're on this project, that you disagree with me a little bit because that disagreement allows us to find a middle ground that is much more sensible, much more balanced. It allows the public to have more trust, I think, in scientists if they were to witness these kinds of disagreements. So here, lamenting, learning from China. That's what he did. He learned from China. Lockdown was not in any of the pre-pandemic playbooks. Uh, school closure was actually not considered for a virus with this low lethality in children. He undermined those things because he was learning from a totalitarian regime. And here he laments the fact that, oh, well, it's so tough to manage the media here because people can say anything. Yeah, that's America. There's always going to be somebody who's arguing the other side. The question is, are you so persuasive? Is your evidence so robust? Are you working so tirelessly to generate more evidence that you can overcome those limitations? And the answer is, he didn't do any of that. He totally failed. He's a derelict leader. Let's come to the next quote. Just keeps getting worse for him. The last one is going to be the worst. This is on the Great And they put together this short declaration which said, let's stop with the closures of businesses and schools. Most people who are under 60 or 65, if they get the virus, they're going to survive. Let's not try to protect them. Let's try to protect those who are vulnerable, the elderly and maybe some others who are compromised. And uh, eventually, the virus will run its course uh, through the healthier people. 
and uh, we will be able to get through this without so much damage done uh, to daily life. It was sort of a letter rip as far as the younger people. I, I will, maybe it's not a great phrase, but it was different than what was currently being proposed. Different. That declaration would have been a great opportunity uh, for a broad scientific discussion about the pros and cons. But that's not how it was presented. On the day it was presented, it was presented to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. It would have been presented the next day to the president if he wasn't in Walter Reed at the time being treated for COVID. This was an effort to take a very fast track of something which would have potentially been a major change in national policy without the opportunity for any debate or discussion. I don't know where to begin. That's entirely dishonest in so many ways. Number one, the original policy of 15 days to slow the spread was the unprecedented policy in human history. We have never done that in any free society in thousand years, closing the whole globe, closing all the borders, preventing people from going out, from working, from using the police state to enforce these rules. This is the unprecedented policy decision. That decision wasn't subject to any debates. That decision was implemented overnight. That decision was implemented at a time of panic when New York City cases were rising. That decision was made by him. He's one of the architects of that decision. The Great Barrington Declaration is a dissenting memo put forth by scientists in October, months after they've been locking down and closing schools and doing all these things to young people who are at extremely low risk of the virus. That dissenting opinion has a different point of view. I actually didn't sign it because I didn't have everything in there that I wanted, but I agree with a lot of the core principles in it. I think the people who did it are admirable. I think they had a point of view. In many ways, they were more close to the truth than certainly the Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci school of thought. They, one of the things they said was all schools should be open. Now, you can read a memo and you can say, well, I don't agree that people under the age of like 60 year old who are unhealthy, that they should be going back to work in person in October pre-vaccine. Um, and I think that's reasonable. But to say that it wasn't the starting point for a debate, that's false. He himself could have had the debate. He could have had the debate to say, what parts of this can we salvage? What parts of this do we might disagree with? Maybe he would have concluded that elementary schools should all open in the fall of 2020. They didn't. They didn't. In San Francisco, they remained closed for another year. He didn't have any debates. He didn't invite those people to the table. He didn't engage in dialogue. He is the NIH director. They're just some random professors, okay? They are the dissenting opinions. He's the person who's setting the policy. He's got it completely backwards. They're not trying to ram this through. He had already rammed through his policy. They're trying to push back on his policy, which by the way, was a total screw up. I think anyone with any ounce of sense would have thought the Swedish strategy is much better. Let most of the elementary schools run. Let most secondary schools run. Most college kids can have a, some normalcy of life. You don't need to use the police state to enforce bar mandates. People have enough voluntary behavioral change. There's no evidence that all of the things Francis Collins recommended had a benefit beyond voluntary behavioral change. He's so dishonest in this. And he, and he not only that, at the time, he disparaged them. He said, we need a devastating takedown of this. He didn't say we need a debate. I wrote about that in stat. I'll put that up on the screen. With Jeff Flyer, in April of 2020, we wrote an article called Let's Hear Scientists with Diverse Views in the Pandemic. That was our initial instinct, is that we need to hear a range of voices. Francis Collins repeatedly avoided hearing those voices. He only wants to hear his own voice, which frankly is full of bad ideas. Just like he was NIH director, it's full of bad ideas there too. I don't think people know this, but as an NIH director, he, he did so many stupid things including his obsession that the genome was gonna change clinical practice and he said it would change you know, blood pressure medicines by 2015. Most of his predictions did not come to pass. In his early part of his career, he did do some good with, with the genomic sequencing project. And like many people in science, you did one thing good in science and then you use that to become an administrator when you have no skill or acumen in administration. And he didn't hear. So I think his criticism of Great Barrington Declaration is inaccurate. One, he says they wanted to protect the older people in GBD. They did, and he didn't. I mean, the current administration's policy was a let it rip in nursing homes. Cuomo allowed people with COVID back into nursing homes. That was the let it rip. And younger people, having them return to normal life is not a let it rip strategy. It's a strategy that says, you know, we know transmission is pretty low and we know the benefits of school may outweigh some amount of transmission. Ergo, it's probably better on average to let young people go to school and maybe pay some teachers some extra pay to get them to be motivated, even though 
The risk of getting sick as a teacher is very, very low, as came out of Sweden. There were all sorts of things he could have done and met in the middle. He could have had town halls. He could have organized debates. He could have had Zoom debates. He did none of that. He wanted to silence the few people who disagreed with him. And they're not just few. There were like 16,000 signatories at the time. So these include people who are even on his side of the political spectrum, like John Ioannidis, you know, people who are otherwise like-minded with him. He didn't want to hear any of those voices. He did the worst job imaginable. He wasn't trained to do this. Maybe he has good intents, but even in his, even in his analysis post hoc, he's still so absolutely off the mark. Now, let me play you the final clip, which I think is just so bad. We weren't really thinking about what that would mean uh, to Wilk and his family uh, in Minnesota, a uh, thousand miles away from where the virus was hitting so hard. We weren't really considering the consequences in communities that were not New York City or, or, or some other big city. The public health people, we talked about this earlier, and this is a really important point. If you're a public health person and you're trying to make a decision, you have this very narrow view of what the right decision is, and that is something that will save a life. Doesn't matter what else happens. So you attach infinite value uh, to stopping the disease and saving a life. You attach a zero value to whether this actually totally disrupts people's lives, ruins the economy, and has many kids kept out of school in a way that they never not quite require for collateral from. damage. Wow. That to me is staggering. Um, first of all, only literally the dumbest student in a public health class would walk away from a public health degree with that message that you focus myopically on one cause of death and ignore all the other social maladies. I think that's a misstatement of what public health is. Public health, when done correctly, is always about taking into account the totality of human concerns and joys and freedoms, as well as what people are willing to do, the constraints on what you can do, and actually leading people to have empowered choices. Public health is not about using the police state to prevent people from gathering. Public health is about offering less risky alternatives. Gathering outdoors will provide free beer, we'll have some heat lamps, things like that that might minimize risk. It's about harm reduction. It's not about some absolutism. It's not about the police state beating people who don't wear masks as has happened in Australia. So he's completely wrong about what public health is. That's number one. Number two, he's admitting that he looked so myopically at New York City, he wasn't considering the fact there was basically zero transmission in the Dakotas in the summer of 2020, and he, they had lockdowns as well. You know, he's not considering that the fact that public health has to have a tailored response to each jurisdiction. He made those mistakes. I mean, this is not complicated stuff. He's basically saying, I was literally the dumbest person in public health, and I was the one shaping the decisions. That's essentially what he's saying. I've heard some people say that you've wanted me and others. We've wanted public health experts to admit their wrongdoing. Now, look, Francis Collins does, and you guys are giving him grief. Um, I don't know. It, it's one thing if somebody says, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon. I've trained for 20 years. I was in there operating, and, um, you know, I made a mistake, and the aneurysm ruptured, and the person died. And I, I'm going to always, this is going to haunt me. I, I don't know if I, my hand slipped. I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I screwed up, and I'm sorry. I've been doing this for 20 years. I got to do better. I apologize to you. You know, that's one type of apology. It's another thing if somebody says, you know what, um, I'm actually not a neurosurgeon. I never was. Uh, I'm actually, uh, but I, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've opened a watermelon a couple times and a cantaloupe. And uh, well, I saw the tools there and I just said, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. I went in there and I was like, whoa, there's a lot of stuff in there. And then actually I killed a person. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm so sorry about that. Maybe if you were so grossly incompetent, you shouldn't have been making the decision in the first place. Maybe if you were so grossly incompetent, you should have invited a variety of people around you to guide you. So that's what is, that's the problem with his apology, his admission of error, is he's not admitting sort of a tiny error, a forgivable error. He's admitting that he had no fundamental competency to be in charge of these decisions. He lacked the simple idea that you would consider the totality of human outcomes. Moreover, there were many of us, many of us, who were saying that in 2020. Steph Burrell, myself, um, Julia Marcus, many of us were writing op-ed after op-ed. He never once reached out to ask us to provide some guidance. I had said many times, at the time I'd been a consultant for Bernie and Ro Khanna on drug price issues, I had said many times, I'm not coming at this from a political bent. I'm coming at this from a bent of what actually makes sense public health. Never invited, he's not even picking, people on both sides of the political spectrum were arguing against him. He never once heard them out. I think. 
His conduct is terrible. His conduct is terrible. We haven't even gotten to lab leak, but very likely that is the culprit of the virus escape. And uh, and he's culpable for that too. He wrote op-eds saying that we need gain-of-function research. Again, he has no evidence. I mean, these are sorts of things he's just saying. He has no evidence for these things. So on masking, he's still wrong. On lockdowns, he's completely wrong. School closure, he did, you talk about life years, saving a life. More years of life will be lost from those closures than the closures ever helped. Because if you don't give people education, you shorten their lives. And guess who learned that? Public health people. They teach that in public health school, which I'm not sure he even attended, actually. I attended public health school at Johns Hopkins University. I actually remember what they taught, even though some of the faculty there, they've forgotten themselves too, because they're all too drunk on politics. On GBD, he's completely wrong. He's so dishonest. He can't just say, here's what I want you to say, Francis Collins. Here's your real apology. I was the NIH director the best person in the country to coordinate a series of cluster randomized control trials on masking, on distancing, on school closure was me. I did not do any because I'm not a good scientist. I don't know that randomized trials are useful in settings of uncertainty. Maybe someone should have taught me that I was a molecular scientist. I didn't really study population science and I don't know much about randomized studies. That's the first thing you can say. Second thing, when I was making these decisions for the entire society, I didn't listen to any dissenting voices. And even though I was the NIH director and I was best suited to convene a series of town halls, I never once wanted to do that. I wanted to put forth a steady, unified message, even if that was completely wrong. And I wanted to squelch all dissent. And in these two domains, I have failed as a scientist, as a human being, and as a leader so fundamentally that I should never be allowed on stage again. I should never hold any office of any importance ever again in the rest of my likely short career. So that's what that's the only apology that's acceptable because that's how bad you screwed up. I cannot understand how any scientist defends zero randomized trials on masking. It is the most divisive issue. They're still implementing it today in hospitals, and there are zero randomized trials. There's zero in children. There's zero in young people. I'm talking about the United States. There's, you know, bang, I know the, I know the studies that are out there. Of course, I've covered them on the channel. I'm talking about the United States. I don't understand how you can be so ignorant of the actual method to answer the question and still so adamant that you are right. I don't understand when he talks about changing evidence in between March and April of 2020 when he knows good and well there was no change to that evidence. He knows that lockdowns were not recommended in pre-pandemic. He knows that masking was not advised by the CDC and WHO in the beginning and not to save masks because they thought community masking wasn't effective. And learning that there's asymptomatic carriage, which he argues, does not make masking effective. It may make it slightly more plausible that it might be, but you still have to test it and validate it, which you've never done, okay? So even on that point, I think he's completely wrong. He won't admit that Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Kohlsdorf had a point. And they had at least two points that I think are indisputable. One, we could have done a better job in nursing homes. People who work in nursing homes could have had like four days on in a row and then had some quarantine in and quarantine out so that there'd be no introduction into nursing homes. And even family members could visit nursing home patients with a quarantine period coming in and a quarantine period going out. I think that those were very sensible strategies that could have allowed nursing home patients to have human contact and be protected. We didn't do any of that. Instead, Cuomo, you know, famously shot them back with COVID into the nursing homes. We screwed that up big time. Those are the population that suffer the highest casualty rates. And then all these young people, Jay Bhattacharya is totally right that on what planet do you justify restricting a six-year-old from, you know, first grade? And of course, all the rich people put their kids in pods and et cetera, et cetera. But all this damage to young people, they're totally right. Now, where do you draw the line? Is it 18? Is it 24? You know, I think it's tricky, but also I think you don't have to let the police state decide these things. These can be decisions that people make. People can assume, assume some risk, okay? There's not much evidence that mandates and police state beyond voluntary behavioral change change pandemic trajectory. There's not much evidence. People see the numbers go up. They change their behavior. That's voluntary. You come in and you implement one more thing that the police is going to enforce something. That requires additional evidence to justify because it's a free society. People can do whatever they want. Okay, so... Francis Collins, just a disgraceful performance. I mean, he's been disgraceful. I've written so many things about all the ways they've screwed up. You know, he's head of NIH for more than a decade. They give out all this grant money. They've never once randomized how they give out the grant money to figure out if it's the best way, this very costly way with study sections or not. He wants to tell people whether or not to wear masks and two-year-olds to wear masks, which was the policy of the CDC and the policy that he laid forward. He wants to do no studies of that topic at all, even though he controls the entire research budget of the country. He wants to come on and say, this could have been an opportunity for debate, that that's not how it was presented. Well, you can present it that way. You're the NIH director. You could have a debate. You chose not to. 
Podcast hosts had more debates than Francis Collins. Podcast hosts were more like, Joe Rogan talked to Sanjay Gupta. Joe Rogan is more open-minded than this guy. This guy is not qualified to make these decisions. He has exhibited nothing but a pattern of failure. His admission shows that he was grossly incompetent. He said, we didn't consider the impact on the economy, on schools and school closures. We didn't consider, you didn't consider the most basic thing to consider. What am I to think? This is an admission of total incompetence and I have no faith or confidence in this man. People say, oh, you should give him credit for apologizing. Yeah, I get, the way I give credit for somebody who's a sociopath and pretends to be a neurosurgeon does an operation and botches it and then they apologize for it. I mean, I give them some credit for apologizing, but uh, maybe they shouldn't have done that because they were grossly incompetent and not qualified to perform the surgery. Okay, so those are my thoughts. Really, really damning, damning stuff here. Um, afterwards, after this, I'm, I'm going to have to do the uh, Bill Maher and um, Seth MacFarlane thing. Um, but, you know, there's no honesty here. There is simply no honesty in pandemic policy appraisal. I've written maybe 250 op-eds, and I think they hold up pretty well. They initially said, let's hear scientists with diverse views and go from there. And we talked about the need to do masking randomized studies, the need in children. So many op-eds I've written about this topic. And again, no one ever reached out who disagreed. They just tried to demonize, to use the Twitter algorithms to suppress you, to go lobby Facebook and YouTube. Right now they're putting something at the bottom that says, Look, ask the CDC about COVID policy. Why would you want to do that? They're the most incompetent agency. We have a preprint up documenting their statistical and numerical errors. That's, that's a bias in the, in the algorithm. To even put that on the screen tells you that they have a better opinion than me. That's absolutely incorrect. I have a much higher batting average of being correct. I think I've done better scholarship, more papers, more productive than many of the people at agency, probably most of the people at agency. I can't think of saying anyone who's better than what we're doing. Okay, those are my thoughts. Francis Collins, total failure, disgraceful performance. Really, you know, somebody needs to have some inquiries into this. Somebody needs to make these people testify with a sharp, a sharp interlocutor, somebody who knows how to press him. I'd love to interview him. He would crumble. He would not last one minute with me interviewing him. Okay, those are my thoughts. You like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below, and I'll be back um, with more. Until next time.